if if we could turn off the yeah there we go uh, gotcha okay <laughs> okay. Uh, Are you zooming in there? Okay. Yeah, we'll stay zoomed out. Yeah, I'm full wide. The, are we closer? Okay, that, that's a beautiful shot. Stay there for a second. Um. <laughs> I can get closer. It's got you on the laser. You okay, the laser so, on so the now, Dan, uh, don't look too relaxed. Uh, now, can you drive over that outcrop there? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah. yeah. And, and then Atlanta follow it. So, uh, should. You turned your laser off, though. Yeah. Yeah, we're trying to simulate that we're. Actually, no, similarly, we actually uh, mowing the lawn here on top of this. We just traversing. Right. Yeah. Nice. So, for those watching uh, from solid ground, uh, <laughs> uh, one of the uh, operational concepts that we will try in the next dives is to get a, a real time. Uh, geochemical and biochemical uh, profile of the seafloor. So as the ROV is moving uh, along, uh, we'll collect data and we'll on the fly generate a map of how the composition of the of the floor is changing. So this is so a I test I to I'm demonstrate at, that we uh, can do it. <laughs> I'm up at 10 meters here. If we dropped it down to your ideal height of three meters, we would get a tighter shot maybe of the vehicle and the rocks. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Give us a sec here and we'll get it sorted out. You can uh, tilt down with that lento a little bit. Okay, um, come down uh, four meters. Yeah, come down. down and, and, and just to verify, Atalanta is recording this video, right? Yes, that's okay. correct. <laughs> All the videos recorded, and then I'm taking still captures over here. Okay. I'm also recording your PC view. And I saved it as a highlight for the end of the season. <laughs> <laughs> Just oh. come down just barely to single digits. Right. Yeah. Okay. If Atlanta hits the sand, you've come too low. <laughs> <laughs> no sampling. Okay, we'll just wait. Um, you saw the ship bouncing there, uh, and Atlanta porp scene. We'll wait till uh, Atlanta's relatively stable, like it is now. That's a beautiful shot. Just uh, one second here. This is going to drag yeah. me crazy. Yeah, done. And when you're ready, drive forward if you okay. can and go gonna, over the I'm gonna, pump. If you put the laser to full power, I'll go cut this rock in half. <laughs> <laughs> Groundbreaking science right here. Yeah, it's there you go. Literally. <laughs> Who needs a hammer? <laughs> <laughs> to me, everything is a nail. <laughs> uh, we're getting a little bounce here, so I'm just going to kind of wait until we get to... Uh, no, I don't think we're going to go that far. Um, you have your scaling lasers on. Thoughts on that? Yeah, we could turn those off, I guess. What's that? Your scaling lasers. The scaling lasers, not to confuse, you know, the important lasers with the <laughs> not as important lasers. Laser. Laser. You want me to pause there? 
Yeah, we'll get the laser back again. Uh, right. Give us a sec. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we're back. <laughs> I'll just wait for the ship to stop bouncing around here. Let's tilt up just a bit and uh, bring our head just a bit to the right. Get rid of some of that tether. Hold oh. still, Nautilus. Cool. Can you call the bridge and tell them to stop bouncing around? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get a beauty shot here. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice... Uh, okay, here we go. That's not quite short there. That's in, uh, Ooh. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that yeah. is a gorgeous laser shot right there. Uh, we, uh, Look at that green to red. That was Ren doing an uncommanded movement there. <laughs> I got it, Ren. <laughs> don't, don't push any buttons for a second. So the Atlanta tilt has a known issue where it will, uh, it will take off on you. I know you're trying to do your job there, but... Uh, just... Yeah, don't don't tilt up or down for for the moment. There it goes again. So when it does do that, you gotta be quick on the uh, power cycle the tilt actually there. Pella, why don't? There it goes again. Sorry, our. Um, our Atalanta tilt actuator has kind of a mind of its own. Real quick shout out. Thanks, Miss Larkham, and your granddaughter for watching from San Antonio. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Uh, lost your laser again there. No, that's. Yeah, no. Yeah. And uh, as a bonus uh, discovery, as we're doing this. Uh, photo up, uh, we're seeing that temperature is coming up in the bottle yeah. and All we're getting right. the signals back here. So so now, exactly, so we're using the laser now to heat up the whole system. And I think this, this, really, this is very good news. Uh, that means that all we have to do in the next dive is to pre-warm the system and uh, keep it on, uh, the heaters on. Uh, mm. Now that we know it's, it's going to get cold anyway, so we'll be able to operate for much longer next time now that we see that temperature can be brought back so so yeah this is great uh, great news so uh, uh, so uh, anybody has since we're all here anybody has a creative uh, photo op that you want to take with this since we're here or <laughs> <laughs> or we should proceed to sampling um, no. no takers <laughs> okay so in that case I think uh, uh, Dan and enough team uh, I think we're ready to uh, to uh, go after samples. Uh, in our case here, we, there's two types that we uh, really need to get. Uh, is uh, some of this rock that we're on top of now. Uh, if there's something loose, great. If not, uh, maybe a way to to get some. And also the sand, the sediment. Um, okay. So those two types is the important uh, thing for us. It's not critical where exactly because it looks pretty similar uh, overall. But we'll we want to add one of its type. Miranda. Yes. Um, I already started writing the sheets for the sediment, so we could do that one first. <laughs> Out of my self interest, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> yes, and if if we could, if it does end up being possible to sink cores here, and if it's not just a fake thin sediment layer. If we could sink all three of them, that would be great. Can do. <laughs> You're making me nervous. You're touching things over there, and I'm watching out of the corner of my eye. So sit on your hands like this. <laughs> then I know you're not doing something. 
I was uh, a little close there. It was within 10 meters, and we're 10 meter delta. So if you move something there, okay, it could be. What is that in the sand? Oh, and Dan, just for your knowledge, also uh, the s you probably know this, but the spectrometer can't get, can't touch rock, can't can't hit rock. Right, that's right next to our DVL that can't hit rocks either. Great, perfect. Hey, do y'all see that thing in the sand? Is that like a little creature, like a little urchin? I didn't get a good look at it. Have been looking elsewhere. <laughs> Ren, you can uh, bring your head a couple I didn't get a good ten degrees to the left, but I think it's some type of an anemone. Some bit. type of an anemone? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Turn on your lights back I on. almost did my worst nightmare, which was the anemone anemone thing. <laughs> well, the anemone anemone anemone. That one in Baby Shark, I'm like, we need to eliminate that from everybody's vocabulary. Now you said it, I'm going to be singing it all night. Yeah, you can turn all the lights back on and... Tilt down and bring your head to the left a little. I just want to give me a shot of the uh, back of Hercules there so I make sure I don't set the spectrometer on a rock. So mm. many beautiful rocks down there. Yeah, that's a nice shot there. So it should be a safe landing zone. Did you hear, Dan, though, that we're going for the sediment first, or for the, the sand first, sand I, cores? I heard, yeah. Thanks. Oh, a little shrimp at the bottom. Oh, and another one up at the top. We are still, by the way, uh, probably at least 25 pounds light. 25 pounds light. Yeah. How's uh, anyone got server cam up back there? Um, we do not because we had to take it offline to be able to patch in the um, spectrometer. Uh, camera. Really? Yep. We had to use one of the PCs, and the oh. others are all otherwise occupied. Oh, yeah. I can pull it up here. You might get a still picture there. Video should change. So, a uh, slurp sand sample, is that what No, you're no, cores. Cores. If possible. Yeah. I think if this is shallow, maybe a little bit further off, away from the rocks would be, we'll see what see how deep that sediment is, or that rock sand. Yeah, I don't know. I'll try it here. Sorry, I missed, uh, I missed that one. I was thinking you were after. Slip sand. Cores might be a little challenging because uh, one of our cameras is not quite dialed there. I believe in you. You like a challenge. Mm -hmm. The entire back row is cheering you on. <laughs> kind of nice to see what you're doing too. I can see it in one camera, so it should be alright. I'm sorry, you needed to have. Uh, you didn't want to just look through one eye. You need two eyes. <laughs> Depth perception. Yeah, yeah. Getting it out of there should be doable. Getting it in. I don't know. I hope it will snaggle teeth, jaws. <laughs> so again, man, I'll, I'm gonna just see me touch it there. Mm -hmm. I know where the jaws are. I remember that thing I was talking about, controlling the jaws. So if I let them go wide open, I'll just wipe out the other core there. Now we're going to... Uh, I'm trying to operate this thing like the other ROV pilots in what we call the flutist mode. That was a tough rubber band you had. Brian, you wouldn't happen to know what that little shrimp is, would you? Huh. I am, from this distance, thinking it's a nematocarcinus shrimp, but I'm not sure. Nematocarcinus? 
Looking it up. Yeah, I don't know how to spell that. New meadow, got that part. New. Crow sinus, don't know. Oh my gosh, you already. <laughs> <laughs> Has ID guide up. Wow, well, on see. the correct thing. Oh, I was wrong. New meadow, car sinus. Okay, got it. <laughs> that was I, comical how far ahead we were. You think you I were. know all these organisms off the top of my head? I look them up. So, uh, you if you remember, uh, early on we took uh, uh. measurements of the sand or sediment, uh, and we got some signal. Uh, now to to learn exactly what this sediment is made of, uh, we're getting what is called a push core. Uh, so, you see the operator here is uh, pushing this tube uh, into the sediment, and uh, that goes down a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't know how far; so depends I how much sediment there is. <laughs> And, uh, and that just comes through there, and we'll bring there it back. And, and then all the sand will just stay in, or is there um, a closing mechanism at the bottom? It's uh, we'll see. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> it'll it's vac it's vacuum, or it's it'll it it uh can it can't fall more. back out. Um, and is that through a mechanism on board Hercules, yeah, or just going, the the nature of how That's you're just taking it? physics. Yeah, it's it will it'll, it's suctioned into the bottom of that core yeah. once we take it yeah, and so, then so we place uh, it. I, I believe the core. Uh, at least some that I used before. It's like a hinge as inside. So sediment can only go in, uh -huh. it doesn't come out. Um, <laughs> so if we take it out, it might look like a little tiramisu with the different layers? Basically. <laughs> at least that's the goal. All right, we'll see idea. how deep <laughs> this sand is now, everybody. Get on that jigger seat. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Are you happy with that spot there? Looks great. Here we go. Yeah, go, go for it. Go on. Looks moment of just truth. as good as the sand next door. <laughs> and, and that's, ooh, still going in. It's so exciting. So now you can see how the name is true to the push. <laughs> or no imagination. Are lifting there. the vehicle yet? Yep. You can see the camera. Coming yep. up there. Yep, so that's it. Okay. Oh, okay. That's it. Mm -hmm. Hmm, decisions, decisions. So it's about what, 15 uh, centimeters? Let's see. Uh, let's see if it yeah, it's maybe like 10 centimeters. Or yeah. yeah. It may just fall right out. It may out just fall out. Well. Let's see. Yeah, it's not a ton. Yeah. <laughs> and it falls out. Okay. Okay. We'll have to go for other sampling method. Uh, oh. It's, too, it's too, also too, very too fine. Yeah, too fine grains. So even yeah. slurping, um, well, like silty sediment, you can take a good core of, but it just slides right out. And even slurping. I don't know, Dan, how do you feel like that'll go up the slurp? Um, it'll, I think it'll go in the slurp. Okay. Give it a try. Yeah, let's go for a try with the slurp then. Okay, Daryl, can you zoom right out for us? And so in that the case, then we would only take one sample, right? You don't yep. need replicates. So, no. and yep. the other ones I was collecting for folks who want cores. So, in this case, we would just take one sand slurp. Yep. And then the slurp is just a fancy, essentially, deep water vacuum cleaner? Yes. <laughs> a deep water vacuum cleaner with multiple bags. Ooh. For multiple samples. So usually we have um, that note we made earlier about tilting that camera down. Usually we have uh, two, like a 90 out view on these, getting them back in the hole. So there's a whole bunch of ripples on the bottom of the uh, that seafloor. Is that from underwater currents? We need to. Uh, that's something we need to yeah, check. Yeah, the Next geological time. term of yeah. that is bed forms. We miss that. And so bed forms. Bed forms. So yeah. So that's that's set up. Um, those are caused by current flow. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, know what you're doing, you can actually infer a lot about the direction of the current flow, how consistent the current flow is by reading um, the different directions and how parallel versus mixed the um, ripples are. I, however, do not have those skills. <laughs> um, but you can kind of infer a little bit here that the sorting is mainly all facing the same direction with some variability. So uh, being 
a biologist playing a geologist on television, um, I would say this it. current is pretty consistent, um, but with some variability moving in the direction that we're looking, more or okay. less. Um, you want to change. And if you look the in the view from Atalanta, you can kind of see an even better idea of yeah. how look at broad camera. it is and a little bit of the variability. And stronger currents that are more consistent, you, you get bigger waves with by. larger um, kind of valleys and troughs by, in between them that can be extremely way. parallel. And then in areas with that are more um, turbid and you get flow lots of different okay. ways, you get and kind you of a mixed, uh, um, almost dune structure without the, uh, that linearity box. kind of structure to it. So again, this is kind of showing us that the currents are heading in the same direction. With with some variability, yep. And uh, it might be a little three. hard here because we're, we're right on in with the isle, um, with these little islands of rock, and so that right. could also be messing with oh, the big laminar flow, causing that little bit of variation. Will be uh, will we be able to see any little creatures that mess with those bed forms? Absolutely. If we, if we start poking around in here, deep sea sediment is a treasure trove of biodiversity and life. If you love classifying different types of worms, this is like heaven for you. <laughs> um, it's really hard to see with the kind of cameras we have and, and the equipment here. We're looking at really uh, macrofauna or megafauna, um, mm -hmm. things that live on top, things that are big, you know, half a meter to a meter. But if you get into what we call the meofauna, which is the little things that live in the sediment, um, the biodiversity of the deep sea is shockingly high um, when it comes to small things that live in the sediment. And you said a lot of them are going to be wormy. They're going to be worm so like body plants, nematodes, um, like that, you know, annelids are kind of the segmented worms, and there's a whole bunch of different phyla that all have more or less worm okay, body plants. It's one of the most successful body plans of any kind of shape of life on Earth. Um, so there's a lot of different phylum in here at the, some of the highest order, highest levels of taxonomy, all with different worm body plans, um, but with different kind of internal structures. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of life out here in the meofauna as well that we really just can't see, um, even with the high definition cameras Hercules carries, yeah, you, you need to have a microscope it. through it. Right. So the three big worm, or I guess three or four, uh, worm phylas are gonna be platyhelminthes, the flatworms, nematoda, the roundworms, um, Rotifera, and then Analyta, which is the segmented worms. That's the big ones, yeah. Then you get then you get into some of the other that are generally bigger, but you get the Sapunculans and the Echiurans, which are kind of wormy. Um, there's a few others too. Ooh, I had no idea about the other ones. I get lost in the taxonomy real quick. Have you? What are we taking this in? Can we do it in jar one? Mm, how about jar six? Uh, but I have OCD, Dan. Zoom, zoom in for us, Daryl. I don't know where Daryl one is. They're not all... Oh, they're not in order yet, huh? No, okay, all right. they're not all... Uh, some of them have sediment in. All right. Last. Ooh, look at that <laughs> coral right there. Six it is, then. Some kind of coral. There you go. Oh, there's a coral. It is a cup a little coral. little cup coral sitting there on that rock. Okay, you can oh, look uh, at them. push in just a little more for us, Daryl. And the cup so corals only get to be about one centimeter? Uh, a little bit bigger going, than that. Keep going. A couple zoom centimeters. In, in. Okay. Um, yeah. So that full zoom? And that is an individual polyp right there. I can't hear you over there. Oh. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, give us a... I'll probably pull one of the earlier images of, for, from uh, Zoomed Out that we something. have. and that'll, you know, go into the folder too, so we know where it came from. You can push in a little more if you got any, Daryl. Like it's us that sorts this, the in situ really only helps That's us, it. so. Is that full zoom video? Full zoom. Right here. Slurp sampler at work. Oh, some interesting chunks. Mm. Oh, and now's the part where we look at the jar and wait for everything to come through. <laughs> yeah, it's taken about 30 seconds, we think. To Ooh, getting to and watch And of course, Dan has quantified this, this wait uh, time. <laughs> we did do some engineering <laughs> tests. You can actually see now um, the exhaust maybe in uh, Atlanta, but in our aft 
Hercules app cam. You can you see, see also, you see um, it's a little blown out right now, that image, but you can see the tube there too in one of the side cameras. Sometimes we'll try and follow a sample up the tube if we'll be like, is it stuck somewhere? Why is it not working? Where did it, where'd it go? And we'll try and find it in the tube. What's that? Yeah. No, you're good. Sorry, the you see that top right? Mm -hmm. I hope you know this is really bad for our pump. You're the one that suggested it, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have a spare. I'm going to blame it on you. Run sand through your oh, vacuum. There's cleaner. one of those little worms right there. So I think uh, quite a bit is going yeah. right through the jar and out. But you can see the uh, our aft camera there. Yeah. To the left of the jar, that's the exhaust right below the camera. Yeah, it's not capturing a lot, is it? Yeah. Why don't you try? Um, let's try back off to uh, fifty percent. Uh, more sand will fall into the jar than 50%. Right. Well, you're definitely getting sand in the tube. <laughs> yeah, that's the sand sample in the hose count. Is that legit? <laughs> uh, if you can get it into a container. <laughs> Well, it, it'll stay in the bend of the hose, so, yeah. Give it a second here and see what happens. Are you going to let off and see if a bunch ends up in the end of the hose? Um, yeah, if you want to. Hit stop there for a minute and see what falls down into the jar. Roger. Yeah. May just have to scoop. Yeah, you can see, uh, Slipped in the hose there. I could probably pour that into the bio box. Yeah. I don't know if it'll stay in your yeah. fish tank or not. You can try put it, try to put it in the one of the f in uh, lambda. Right there. Whatever's easier. It doesn't matter. Okay, you can go right there. Okay, so I'm not going to call that flush jar one a sample. I mean that's really minimal. So we'll probably uh, we'll try and get some of this into the forward bio box and maybe supplement that with a scoop. Uh, yeah, you can extend the tool. And I would just call the whole thing a scoop. So I'm yeah. attracting the camera at the same, same time. Same sand. Uh, the left one? Uh, no, I wouldn't just because they're going to analyze the geochemistry of it and I don't want to slough off any crust, you know. Uh, left or right? Uh, Whatever's easiest for you with your, uh, yeah, manipulating this. <laughs> Is that uh, box all the way out, is it? Like sand through the hourglass. That's some fine sand. It is. Yeah. So maybe um, let's. The scoop is accessible, right? Or is the scoop not on for this? For we the have the um, laundry bag scoop. The laundry bag scoop. Oui. Yeah. Okay. Probably All right. not too good for sand. No. How <laughs> much sand do you, uh, Pablo? How much sand do you need? How much do we have in milligrams? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was about to be like, um, we probably, yeah, I don't know, have the equivalent of like, Maybe a like a, you have like 200 a, mil. Like an espresso that, shot? Uh, yeah. Worth? A little more than an espresso shot, I think, made it yeah. in there. Maybe like a, a double espresso. <laughs> we could, um, I can use the. Yeah, yeah let's try and get some more, maybe twice that. You want to uh, try to use the end of the section to scoop yeah, up a little? Yeah, I just fill up yeah. the tube and do that yeah. again. Yeah. It'll seem to work. Okay, yep. can you retract the box? 
Yeah, I guess if you push okay. it down and side yeah. and up. Yeah, right? we're going to try roll. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a new new yeah. sample technique here. So nobody I don't know what to call this. You're breaking the rules. This is the slurp. This is the scoop. Yeah. <laughs> nobody brought the beach That's toys. Good. <laughs> little, little rake, the little shovel, yeah. uh, little bucket. <laughs> Pretty much. Yep. I'm just gonna want can I get Western with it here? Oops. Yep. Because we don't the only scoop we have is the laundry bag scoop that's good for sampling nodules, but the sand will go right through that. Okay, open the box again. So this is the inside of that tube is a uh, inch and a half diameter. So. Oh, uh, one second. <laughs> okay, that's that's great. Uh, if you can shake it off, we're good. a scoop just because it's in a bio box. Okay, so that's, if you're asking about sample number, it is NA149001. Perfect. Yes, I am going to ignore the slurp and call this a scoop. And all those things are slightly untrue. But okay, I think the rest is just dust. Now the hard part, getting this thing back on the magnet. The magnet back on the <coughs> 499 Home Depot electrical cover. It's cleverly hidden here on the side of the box. Maybe more. I don't know. We'll find that out. <laughs> These don't need to match like perfectly exactly. That was 0343 was when we ended that. And since I didn't really look, I mean, it's just kind of a long process now. Uh, somewhere around, let's say we started at 033. So uh, okay. that is enough uh, sediment for us. Uh, anybody else need sediment for here? Um, I think that we're going to keep it at that because the other folks that needed sediment wanted cores. Okay. So uh, let's proceed to to the more fun stuff. Uh, Done. Let's try rock. Let's try uh, this one here. See if it's loose. Uh. Right here. <laughs> well, I think it's always pick one I just embarrassingly can't. Oh, no, that one's not loose. Uh, video, can you zoom in just a little bit? These, uh, that one's loose. So the, the shrimp didn't like it. Uh, There's a very small one that's loose there. Yeah, yeah that is good, Danny, if you can get that. Um. Yeah, I can uh, poke around here and see if anything else moves. It's a very small piece there, but... So nice. Uh, we'll go back and get the sample. Video, sample. can you zoom in there for us? So now, yeah, now so now we're taking from different angles some pictures of the rock quick, and we started that. Yeah. Happy with that? Yep, I'm happy with that. No, 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 it's more of a store. pebble or cobble. Hard to call a rock. <laughs> Would you mind uh, giving it a real quick spin, please? Right there. 
And that'll be 02, of course, the net. Yep. So is Adam here? No. Uh, so I'm going to play geologist here uh, with all the respect to the real geologists online. Yeah, so it looks to me like a little oxidized uh, piece of uh, igneous uh, silicate. So essentially basalt that has been, uh, the iron is turning to rust, uh, thus hence the brownish no, 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 and red no. color. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a great piece because it has a little bit of the sediment on it. I can see a little bit of the, of perhaps organic uh, uh, biomass here or some kind of biofilm uh, maybe so it will be a good uh, a good test uh, piece to bring back yeah um where do you want to put this you can put it up front or? uh yeah if you don't care about the scratchiness um you don't want these this mixed with uh, yeah, yeah I mean, you know, in, in fact, uh, you can put it in the same yeah, place as the sun. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then Since let's they do came from the first same place. Yep. yep. Okay, go, That's what I, I go was like, they're, there. they're next to each other now. Yep. <laughs> I like it when you make samples. Okay, you can uh, open the toolbox there for us, please. Rin. Typing so hard at the first. Nice. Okay. And, uh, the box. Next, uh, then I would like a little bit something more in the black side of things. So uh, perhaps this one here may be loose. Uh, and, uh, the or, or even this one here, maybe you can watch it out. Uh, yeah, I'll poke around and see if any of them, uh, any of them move. Okay. Also add these comments, yeah, which I see, can't yeah. remember. I think we can see Correct. later on too. So, and um, this will be uh, repositioning the ROV and oh, it oh, nice, move. yeah, that's loose, that's great. Yeah. Okay, so that's pick that one up. Then. Yep, and go for that. it. That ended at like forty-seven. Um, and that's also in. Stand by, it's got to turn our uh, bender off here. It's making the. Uh, ground fault sensor sends a pulse mm -hmm. and uh, when the arm is ground faulting like that the uh, but it's the arm again from earlier the pulse um, it makes yeah. the arm jump around so we turn it off when we're getting the sample now uh, you can push in a bit there if you want Daryl mm -hmm. that's good mate. the right one mm-hmm Oh, that's plastic. Okay, I think you should go eat. Let's look. Partially oxidized there. Yeah, so, so in this case we're seeing uh, a crust around that oxidized area, right? That's the black part around. Yeah, That's probably fresher, uh, fresher uh, basaltic material. Uh, maybe some speckles or inclusions maybe of uh, like the, like this one's here, 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 like 
large quartz, uh, maybe even carbonate, uh, we don't know. So it's something that we can see uh, with the sample when it's up here. So, and again, we see some growth here. Uh, uh, maybe, if not sediment, uh, hard to see, but uh, looks like life there. So, great sample. You want to stick that in the same box with the other rock, do you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome. yeah. I, I think it's all in the same group here, so. Yeah. Quick spin, too, please. And Pablo, would you mind, I was listening elsewhere, would you mind describing uh, what features of the rock or yeah. composition of the rock? Real yeah, quick so what we're looking at here, it's, uh, a it's, a, it's an old volcano, right? So volcanoes yeah. are made of silicate. So the black material we see there is, well, Generally, generally speaking, Thanks, will be an igneous uh, silicate, which is very, oop, uh, <laughs> which is very, uh, very rich in wait. iron. Uh, and as iron gets in contact with water, and if you have any metallic thing around your house and it gets rained on, uh, over time it starts to develop rust. Um, so that is the orange areas that you see uh, here uh, in this phase. Uh, all that orange uh, stuff is oxidized iron. Are they, so, uh, are they iron oxyhydroxides? Yeah, they could be both uh, oxides and oxyhydroxides, okay, you can go which is different arrangements from the mineral that contain more or less uh, water and hydrogen. Um, no, uh, no, you can open the maybe there is some there manganese one. oxides there as well. Uh, one of the hypotheses is that uh, uh, manganese and iron uh, Good, uh, rain down, uh, precipitate down over time, perhaps creating films and one layers moment, of, uh, of these uh, oxides uh, over millions of years. Uh, and now we're seeing this uh, here. So very interesting sample here to to test that hypothesis of how old this mound is, and how much uh, the position of uh, manganese, iron, and perhaps other elements uh, have happened here. So uh, very good sample to to really start answering questions about this uh, this mound. Maybe we find something and we find a name for the mound uh, after that. Uh, okay, I can close we'll it. see. Uh, Okay, and uh, I would like one third sample because uh, uh, three times is charm. Um, so uh, maybe uh, go up a little bit so we have a little overview of the of this area uh, here. Um, right here. Can you um, switch from the bucket cam to the rail cam there for me? Okay, so that should be... It's on um, Atlanta. Would you come up just a few meters? Come up five meters. Okay, then uh, hold on there. I think uh, this is interesting here. You see uh, uh, that one? It's a little longer than the other ones. Um, Uh, and so th this one here that we're trying to get, uh, it's going to be big enough to cut it. Yeah, right? So I think it's going to be a good one to, to use the, the cutter, yeah. the cutter Rock, uh, just to off. expose it and see the different layers there. Uh, you want to telestrate to exactly which one you want just because yeah. you can? 
Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, that's right. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna use different features here, like whip, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, we have come, this cool uh, screen here where I don't have to tell the navigators. And then I didn't fill in the whole number. Go yet. left, go right, pick this one, pick that one. Mm. I just can touch the screen and make a circle, and they know exactly what they need to get. Come down really a useful. little bit faster there. Yeah, cool. yeah, and you see, in these areas here, you can start seeing uh, like almost different inclusions of perhaps right. other minerals like uh, carbonates, maybe, or or quartz. So, uh, so I think we're gonna gonna have a lot of fun with this rock uh, when it's up here. Uh, Want uh, not the big one, right? It might be too big. Yeah, I think you may want to try this one then. <laughs> It's just a giant rock in the sediment there. Maybe, maybe there's... Hmm. Doesn't look like it's loose. Uh, it does not appear to be loose. Uh, yeah, is it pretty, pretty stuck there, you feel? Yeah, um. yeah t t try with this one behind the arm. See. Yeah. Uh. And the intermittent button on the end of this master controller is killing me. Hmm. That was not me. Yeah. Well, that should not have been possible. Very strange. <laughs> I'm pushing the vehicle up there. Yep. Fish, fish, yeah, yeah. Does that fit in any of our bio boxes? <laughs> nice. Ooh. Oh, come yeah, on. so I don't know if you got a chance to see, but there was a little white spot there, and that speaks about a uh, more uh, or longer um, uh, reprocessing of the rock uh, over time. Again, more water uh, uh, keeps dissolving and keeps reacting with the materials there, and some things get incorporated in the in the in the rock. So we could be seeing a sulfate right there, maybe a hydride, um, calcium sulfate. Um, so that's going to be a very very interesting uh, rock to see. Yeah, yeah, and it has a little flower on top of it. Yeah, is that a type of coral that we're looking at? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, with the I Telestrator. I love it. I think it. we don't know yet. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> it does look like a little flower. So yeah. I think, yeah, you're doing good. Yeah. Picking a flower for Hercules. Whenever they have it from like closer and different angles. Oh, and, and that looks like a really so good it, rock, like you were saying. This is where I'm doing the balance of like describing Great cuts and done. picturing. Yeah. I love this rock. What's that? It kind of looks like it's hanging off of the side. Yeah, so this may be like an old coral uh, there on the side. Yeah, this is really interesting, yeah. What's that yellow bit over on the left-hand side? Yeah, so this yellow area here is another iron oxide. Um, oh! Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I think that's an anemone wrapped around an old dead skeleton. That's what <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually think that no, that's No, I'm sorry. Just like, we're like, it's okay. a beautiful flower. <laughs> <laughs> it's an old dead skeleton. <laughs> It's yeah. either that or it's a benthictina four on a dead skeleton. <laughs> one, one of those things. So death is certainly a part of this thing. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that was a perfect shot, Dan. <laughs> and I think that scallop. Something with A. What were you gonna say? I think the the scallopy looking stuff growing on the right is some type of xenophyophore. Uh huh. But yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah Brian is talking about this area. The here. sample tree. So, yeah, noting what I love the telestrator. So Just like this and this. <laughs> <laughs> it makes so much sense. No, I'm glad you're doing it. Really Pointing it around. out. Yeah. So we got iron oxide, a dead skeleton, <laughs> uh, ABC animal on the side. <laughs> and there's our dead skeleton. Yeah, and, and we really love this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's not in the box yet, so. Okay. <laughs> Are you just trying to jinx it now? No, it's just kind of a flat, wobbly rock, and I don't know if it'll fit. So. Okay, if you uh, want to go wide for us. If anybody yeah. could do it, it's you, Dan. So, and this one, Dan, uh, since it comes from different place, uh, different box, please. Yes, definitely different box. And that'll, we'll have to see what box that fits in. <laughs> On starboard there's pretty much only one option there right yeah one, one of those two <laughs> <laughs> so is this the first rock of the evening no it's the third one the third rock. Yeah, oh my yeah. gosh! I took a ten-minute dinner yeah. break, oh, you and y'all. <laughs> no, I missed all the action. You missed almost everything, except for the really cool laser picture moments. Yeah, that was uh, that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, so, so so just to recap, uh, we got uh, about four hours of uh, of data collection. We did uh, water column uh, analysis as we were descending. Uh, we saw how the the amount of organic biomass uh, or organic matter uh, both dissolved and particle decreased uh, over time meaning decreased uh, as as depth increased as we're going down and is this something that y'all expected to see yeah that's expected uh typically uh, uh in most places uh what we expect to see is that that change over time uh with our measurement so with the data now we can process that and create the you know, a typical map of, you know, abundance of organic in the water column, all the way from 50 meters down to 12, 1,200 meters. So that's the very yeah. first scientific uh, result with uh, our instrument. Second one is that uh, we analyzed the sediment, uh, analyzed uh, some of the rocks that we collected, uh, mm -hmm. right? So we have that type now in the bag, bring it up uh, top side so we can uh, now measure that with other instruments and so we can benchmark the performance of the instrument uh, so you have another uh, a raman spectrometer here on board no we don't we use the same one so, so oh yeah, okay yeah so we can in fact uh because will you like just set it in front of the hercules and just be like go yeah. go laser no 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 so it gets better so uh, because our instrument is only rated for 1500 meters mm -hmm. but there are dives that require us to go to go down we our system can detach pretty easily from Hercules, and uh, we can use it in the lab here. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a safety device that prevents the laser from hitting people around. <laughs> and uh, just, you know, saf safety first uh, sometimes. Uh, and, uh, and that way we can just run, like, we s if, like if it was a lab, essentially. Fresh samples run in the lab here uh, mm -hmm. to really keep advancing, you know, uh, the, the learnings about the instrument. Overall, uh, we're not gonna Super successful the way, so first deployment the box in for a new tool. I've been in the, bus the business of building technology for 20 years. Uh, I have never had a more successful uh, first uh, test of any instrument Possibly. that I've ever made. Uh, there's always something bad, something breaks. Here, nothing broke. Um, the only glitch we had is that we learned that uh, the instrument gets really, really cold uh, down there, uh, colder than we thought. Um, and. Uh, Consider that yeah. we have lasers inside, which warm up a little bit. Other areas get a little colder, and we do have heaters all over the place, but today we want to be conservative 
and uh, not overheat the system because it could cause problems down the line. So we learned today that uh, what we need to do next time we dive is from the beginning, keep the heaters on and that will keep the system warm and cozy all the way through the next That's eight it. hours, 12 hours. So, so it's a great uh, learning, uh, great data. That's and fine. we can wait to get the handle on that and share with our science team onshore, uh, interpret the data and get, you know, a report here to everybody about, you know, what we're learning about this place. So, so are you going to be uh, trying out the Raman spectrometer on another dive or was this? Yeah, no, no, we, well, we'll try it uh, as, you know, uh, as many dives as, as we can as within, what did you say, 1500 yeah, meters? Yeah. Any dive that goes to 1500 meters or shallower, we're there. So we'll. I love that we're there. <laughs> we're there. We'll hopefully be able to find new places, you know, with corals and other uh, mineralogy, mm -hmm. maybe even ancient vents. Um, uh, so we're really, really excited to to retry that uh, here. So, yeah, we'll be online often here. So uh, yeah. So uh, is this solely for rocks and minerals, or can this be used on biological sampling? Yeah, so uh, as you saw today, if we were fine tuned, uh, tune into the into the broadcast, or, or I just told you right now, <laughs> if you're new, uh, we were able to measure gases, liquids, and solids, right? And so the first experiment we did is uh, we shot the laser at infinity, right, over the water column uh, underneath us, and we were able to collect data of the water, of course, itself. Uh, uh, we saw sulfate, of course, uh, ocean water has sulfate. And we were able to measure organic matter as we're going down. So uh, the answer is yes, we can measure three things, right? Uh, uh, the water and its components, uh, minerals, and organic matter. Uh, in fact, within the organic matter group, uh, we can distinguish pigments. So mm -hmm. if something is... You can uh, distingu distinguish pigments? Different pigments, yeah. So chlorophyll versus carotene, so alanine, so uh, any pigments out there, we know the signal, we know what it looks like, and we can distinguish all of that as well. So it's really... a Swiss Army knife uh, now tool for the ocean, right? where we can see both minerals and organics at the same time. And the idea here is, as we're thinking about um, utilizing resources in the seafloor, uh, minerals for uh -huh. uh, you know batteries, turbines, panels. Uh, an important uh, thing is going to be uh, to to minimize the environmental impact of mining activities. Yeah. So uh, so one way to do that is to co-explore uh, both minerals and biodiversity in these areas. So by doing that, we can find and areas that are very, very, uh, very heavy on amount of uh, ecology, on diversity. Those are areas that perhaps we need to preserve uh, mm -hmm. for uh, ocean uh, well-being in general. So again, even if there are wealth in minerals, if there is wealth in biodiversity, those places will not be, uh, be mined. And that's kind of the, the point here is to really uh, help find those things. The minerals where not, there is lower there environmental impact of mining, come those that have high environmental on. impact, and go only for ones that have, you know, the lowest uh, uh, again, impact on, on, the, on the ecosystem down there. Um. So would you be constantly lowering this down on uh, an RV like Hercules, putting it on an AUV, or would you be able to mount it from a boat? Dan, when you have a, a chance, yeah, or so if the, possible, could the, we zoom the, on the, the next phase of this program? This is those just the first test of a yeah, the multi-decade so. uh, program in which we will slowly, progressively okay, mount uh, our instruments in more intelligent vehicles, more autonomous vehicles. So Give next spring, at about this time of the year, we will mount the version two of this instrument that we're building already. Uh, and now we're going to actually improve it with the learnings from this uh, test. And is that like well, a, the yellow submarine looking thing? Yeah, exactly. So, okay. so we will, we, we will uh, uh, mount uh, the next version of this into an AUV. An AUV is an autonomous underwater vehicle, which unlike uh, Hercules here, uh, does not require pilots, right? So here we have a team of six to eight people that are <laughs> helping us really, you know, when it's I say, full zoom. hey, I want that sample. Hey, I want water. Uh, there's a team of people, humans, that have to really maneuver this, and so that, that becomes time-intensive, uh, costly. I mean, I can uh, hear you. Uh, cost, I can hear costs a lot of money to, to do this. Yeah. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to really uh, oh, sorry. this is full yeah. zoom. If you can hear me, reduce the amount of uh, of human input that we need here, and automate all of these uh, measurements here. So I'm here with Kevin and myself, and we are uh, we are the now? human robots, if you want. Uh -huh. So when we say, hey. Longer distance, more time, try this, try that. That's what a machine right. will do automatically next zoom. year, right? So 
the answer is yes. The answer is to, in fact, not just use one AUV, it's to use a swarm of them. Use multiple AUVs that will come, they will mow the lawn yes. on the seafloor, learning about everything autonomously. You know. So then I know you. this technology was help partially funded by NASA, yeah. and I know previously you have talked about uh, more outer space potential for this. Can you describe a little bit about oh, what's yeah. some outer space technologies for this? Or applications, yeah. there we go, applications. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, we are yeah. trying to to figure out what we're doing next. Yeah, okay, so uh, we've done sampling here. I think uh, it will be uh, nice as we're here to do a little exploration around. Uh, yep, we're, yep. Yeah. we can head on to waypoint two. Yeah. If we want to go ahead and get the ship moving. Yeah, back row. Do we have all the samples we want in this area? Yes, we do. Okay, yeah, Excellent. and that last one was four. And you got that, I think, but I got it. Yep. Okay. Uh, we got pictures okay. of that plenty, so, yep, ready for. Okay. Waypoint two, yeah. So yep. I think we're going to head uh, southwest toward waypoint two. Full zoom. Southwest. About 450 meters away, and we'll be going down slope, um, but not much, about 25 meters. And at some point along this, we'll be basically heading in the same direction for the rest of the dive. At some point, it'll probably get steep enough we'll want to jump off and uh, and go down and then come back up. But you guys can, you in the front row can tell us when you feel that way. You need to do that. Yep. Did you hear that, Dan? Okay. Yeah, south of waypoint two, it gets steeper. Okay, you ready for some ship moves? All right, let's do it. Bridge nav. Can we move five zero meters two two zero, please? Thank you, and and we can go zero point three knots. Thank you. Thank you. So um, can you go ahead and tell us a little bit about what are the future applications in outer space? Uh, I know so much of this technology was partially funded by NASA. Yeah, Kitty, so uh, yeah, now I can answer it after we, you know, <laughs> so, so, so we have the navigation pilots. We're going to move uh, to a different location within the same region. And they have to communicate with the uh, bridge and, and tell them that. So now that we're on course, I can take some time to explain the connection with space. So. As it turns out, uh, Earth is not the only planet uh, or moon in the solar system that contains oceans of water. Uh, there are a number, to be determined number of uh, moons in Jupiter and Saturn, uh, the more famous being Europa and Enceladus, uh, which we know have oceans of liquid water. In fact, Europa has many more times, m many times more water than Earth has. And it's salty water pretty much like the ocean here. So, and Europa, uh, is that Jupiter or Saturn? Europa is Jupiter, uh, and Enceladus is uh, Saturn. Uh, so these are the two most interesting moons that we know of so far, uh, uh, of which we have evidence uh, of liquid oceans under the crust of ice. Uh, now what happens is that uh, these two, two, moons are so far from the sun yeah. that they're almost, you know, not almost, they're frozen. But uh, they are so close to the big giants, they're so close to uh, Jupiter and Saturn, that they, su they, they suffer in extreme tidal forces uh, uh, with those planets, right? So but what that do does is that the moment you have a little bit of water that is in friction, is, uh, is scratching against the rock in the, in the seafloor, that creates heat. That heat cre increases the pressure five? of the water, and the water becomes a pressure cooker. So the whole planet becomes a pressure cooker, and at some point it will crack, it will pop. And the way it pops is that it finds little weaknesses in the yep. ice. <laughs> so when you it, say it pop, it it's just pop in the outside or pop in, in, the, in well, the core? Uh, sorry, pop, pop in the outside, right? So, uh, so uh, it, it finds little cracks, little, little uh, uh, weak, fissures. Weak points, weaknesses, fissures, yes, yes. Fissures that, uh, you know, has a little, little weakness there and boom, up it goes the <laughs> fluid uh, up through the cracks. 
it travels anywhere from one mile to 10 miles. We don't even know how thick this uh, ice is. And this uh, is highly is. pressurized water yeah. making yeah. its way through the, the cracks way, the because space, of yeah. the, the pool of Jupiter and Saturn. Yeah, yeah the tidal forces make this, uh, this pressure up and it has to go somewhere, right? So this is ways to go to space, which is vacuum. <laughs> so it finds its way quickly into the vacuum of space. So uh, obviously, uh, as soon as it hits uh, cold temperature, it freezes down. So the only thing we see coming out of these planets, moons, is ice, yes, ice jets. They're like geysers of mm -hmm. ice. So you can Google that. Uh, so fact, frozen yeah. glaciers yeah. in space. Yeah, yeah. This uh, sounds yeah. unreal. And so this is, you know, this is what keeps a lot of us uh, uh, fed and with a job, is to really explore these areas. And, and the important part here is, uh, it's cool that there are oceans, but the coolest part is what's under the ocean is the rocky rocky crust, right? The seafloor of these places. And we know, because we have sampled this ice, these mm -hmm. geysers that come out of in, into space, we know that it contains uh, silica, contains methanol. And silica, that's the main ingredient in glass, correct? Uh, silica, exactly. Well, silica is the main component of any rocky interior of any planet. Okay, okay. And, but the fact that it's coming together with ethanol and other elements is indicative of uh, hydrothermal activity in the seafloor, Ooh. which is what most of us know as uh, black smokers mm -hmm. or white smokers. Yeah, the chimneys. quintessential um, oceanography, yeah. the hydrothermal vents, the black exactly. smokers. You look at the city in the Atlantic, or you look at uh, Juan de Fuca, all the uh, axial, yep. all the Was chimneys there. Uh, all of those are expressions of uh, active magma uh, activity. Okay. In the in the bottom in the in the in the mantle that is coming out into the ocean, and we think, or I guess the most prominent theory of origin of life on Earth, is that life started in these uh, systems in the bottom. Uh, think about this: so you have an ocean water which is very cold and almost empty of anything. There's some chloride, uh, you know, some salt, maybe some sulfate, but it's pretty pretty boring. It's just water essentially. Now you're coming with a hot stream, very mm -hmm. hot, maybe 400 degrees Celsius, hot stream full of rich uh, minerals, iron, potassium, silicon, gold, anything you can imagine. It's very, very rich uh, fluid. As soon as it encounters the cold uh, ocean, what happens? It precipitates down, it rains down minerals, it makes uh, platinum deposits, gold deposits, uh, silicates like what we're seeing here, uh, black rock, and this is where life loves to play. Life likes these extreme gradients, extreme differences between temperature and between nutrients. So the moment there is a, an interface, a, call it a membrane, right? The wall of a volcano, of a chimney, that wall uh, becomes where life likes to live. That's perhaps where, you know, again, metabolism early started to really harness this disequilibria, this, uh, these gradients between hot and cold, rich and poor, right? So so the same the, way that yeah. we have, we believe hydrothermal vents uh, was where life started on our planet. Now we've discovered that there's the possibility of hydrothermal vents on Enceladus and Europa. And yeah. so, so, wow. So, so think about it, right? So, so you know, we, we, we think that life started here on these places. Mm -hmm. Now we have the same places in two moons out there, right? So the only conclusion there is that, yeah, if you want to look for life, Maybe this is a very good place to look for life. Uh, Mars is great and it's easy, but yep, yep. maybe it's better to go to these icy moons. And you find life there because this life is underground, the ice crust and the ocean. The only explanation that, that life is there is that it's different life than Earth. This is a totally different genesis. It's life 2.0. Yeah. Whereas on Mars, uh, yeah. we know there has been meteorites coming back and forth, uh, transfer of matter, which may have transferred the building blocks of life. Yeah, or maybe from asses. Earth to, yeah, Mars, to Mars or Mars vice to versa. So, so we may be Martians, <laughs> and Martians may be Earthlings. So, but if we find life there in these chimneys, uh, that's that really becomes the second, second genesis, genesis of life. Yeah. And I think that's the really fascinating part of the story. And, you know, going back to the story, so why is NASA funding us? Well, NASA is funding us because NASA wants to do the same thing we're doing here on Europa and Enceladus. So what is the best way to practice for that? Well, you just go to places on Earth that mimic and uh, and get you close to what we will find in those moons uh, in the next decades as we drill down the ice and we eventually find ourselves in the ocean. Uh, so that's the connection 
of NASA and the heavy investment that NASA is putting lately in, mm -hmm. in ocean sciences is because they see Earth as another ocean world uh -huh. that we can explore to learn how to explore other ocean worlds. So it becomes a playground for everybody. So to me, it's something deeper than that, is that you know, finally we have a connection, a convergence of space science and earth sciences, and it's the ocean that is bringing all that together. So it's a fascinating place to be right now, and to me, a lover of both ocean and space, I find this to be a, a really good opportunity to really uh, keep using my creativity to help both oceanographers and mm -hmm. Europaographers, I guess. <laughs> so <laughs> or, right or now we're scientists. testing out uh, the Raman spectrometer on Hercules, but then potentially the next step would be putting it on a rocket, taking it out to Enceladus, taking it out to Europa, yeah and doing the same thing that we're doing here, where it can test both mineral, gas, uh, biological life, over on one of those yep. Europa or Enceladus, one of those other uh, ice, I want to say ice planets, although they're yep. not a planet. Well, they've been called icy moons, uh, ocean worlds. Ocean uh, worlds, you know, there yeah. we go, I yeah. like yeah. ocean worlds. That's a good, that's a good uh, <laughs> one, so, yeah. So potential, yeah. so your, uh, your technology that you're developing and testing out right here has the potential to possibly help find a second genesis yep. on an on an ocean world. Yeah, I think that's, that's <laughs> a very good way to put it. And, and I think, you know, I think true to the mission of OET, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's like we're exploring places that we never explored before. And yes. by proxy, right, by doing this work here, we are really advancing our chances to do, the, do a great job uh, uh, in other moons, right? So it's really, really, uh, I mean, really comes, comes together pretty nicely here, right? So, um, and yeah. a really great first successful dive, you said. And I mean, uh, again, back to the to the results we got today. I think it's been better than we expected. Uh, the team, to start with, the team is exceptional, right? Uh, yep. Anywhere from our diversity interns um, to scientists, engineers, mm -hmm. uh, and managers across industry, government, uh, academia, and research institutes. Uh, it's been a really team team effort. They really built a tool that really was supposed to work perfectly but we all have been in this place before uh we've mm -hmm. all been the launch pad have our system explode there into pieces we've all always had our things on mars and crashing and you know not working yeah uh, so there's always a chance right when we're doing extreme uh exploration when you're doing cutting edge technology that something's gonna go wrong something you never thought of you know and unexpected uh unknowns right and uh, today, we only found one, to be honest, and out of the 20 that I was oh. expecting. So, uh, so uh, I think it's really, really successful day for us. Yes, ma'am. That was a great explanation. Thank you so much. That's of another bamboo, yeah. Um, Brian, did you manage to find an ID on the anemones that we've been seeing a lot of? Okay, yeah, because of the white, the white tippies. Um, okay, so you can put that in then too. Yep. Oh, and there, there's a, and a sponge and a crinoid. So much happening. So I would like make sure to. Sometimes I do that while I'm writing, and then switch back. Uh, no, no, where'd that come from? Oh, okay, Katie, you got that? Yes, ma'am. Great. So is that a... So I'd be commenting on the bio during this part. Um, so this is... Is that a sea lily right there that was at the edge of the camera? <laughs> yep, so that's uh, a, a yeah. actually crinoid. Feather or star. Feather oh, star. crinoid, yes, yes. Because uh, oh, it doesn't that have its own stock. <laughs> <laughs> and so, a, and so it's a crinoid me. on a metallogorgia. <clears throat> so a crinoid is just a type of echinoderm, so related to starfish, right? Yep. Oh, and we're taking it as a sample, or is it just waving towards us? Mm. I think it's just waving towards us. And what is it on, what's that? piece of coral behind it that you said it's on I didn't know the word it's a metallogorgia metallogorgia which yep. is a type of deep sea coral yep it's a it's a, a member of the family Chrysogorgia day 
um, and then it's got a Astra Schema Brittle Star tied up in a tight little knot in the center there. <laughs> so we got three completely different organisms there, two from the same phyla, one from a completely different one. And this is a really good example of why like we think about deep sea corals as being uh, ecosystem engineers. So they're providing three-dimensional relief, getting up into the water column. Um, and obviously these two other organisms are um, using that structure provided by the coral. That's a power timer. To, uh, <clears throat> All right. And all of this kind of started, like we were talking in our conversation the other day, with the geology with the rocks kind of serving as the the base for all these different eco or all these different types of life to attach onto. Oh, he's beautiful. And if we can get one really tight look at uh, its polyps, that would be appreciated. Uh, it looks like it also might have an egg case in there, too. That little green what? blobby thing there might be uh, some type of cephalopod egg case. I can't tell yet. The green, oh my gosh, that might be an egg case. Or that's probably, it looks like it might be the remnants of an egg case. And that would be the egg case from the brittle star? No, the, the probably actually, that's well, we don't know for sure. There's one or two documented cases, actually, of those being Dumbo octopuses, octopi. What? Uh, egg cases. Oh my gosh. But we don't know that extensively for all of these. It could be many other things. But that has got some hydroids, it looks like, living on top of the egg case, or what might be the remnant egg, egg case in there as well. Man. And because there are, in each one of those polyps, there's eight tentacles hanging out. Is that the correct terminology, tentacles? All right, tentacles are arms. Tentacles arms. So that makes it an octocoral. Yep. Thanks, Dan. We got what we need. OK. <clears throat> so these metallogorgias are, are um, kind of a specialist, it seems, in these uh, a little bit flatter areas. We rarely see them in steeper terrain. Um, they like these kind of flat platforms to grow in, whereas a lot of the other corals out here we see in steeper terrain. So how did you learn all these scientific names for corals? Because you have them all down pat. Oh, not even close to I have them all down pat. I, uh, I have a guide in front of me, and I'm cheating by <laughs> looking them up. And but even without it, you just roll these names off the top of your tongue. And I literally sit there with flashcards on the okay. plane right out here. That was my next question. I am a, I'm an ecologist broadly, and so I, I know less of the specific fine minutia of the taxonomy of what makes one of these that. I generally work with taxonomists who help me identify these things, and then I look at some of the larger broad scale patterns of where you find them and the interaction between the, the abiotic or non-alive factors of the environment with these and what controls them. Looks like we've got a little snaffabranket eel um, swimming in between the cracks of those bigger rocks there. Oh, there he is. Another Chrysogorgia here, probably another bamboo coral, a couple Venus flytrap anemones. So with the Venus flytrap anemones, what are they trying to trap? Is it phytoplankton, marine snow? Basically anything they can catch. Um, we, we don't know a whole lot about the feeding preferences. Can we go check out that sponge, please, coming in the top right? Oh, um, beautiful. Glass sponge, right? Yep, that's a hexactinellid of some type, probably a euplectellid, but I'm, again, I hesitate to is get really specific on a lot of the sponges. Is it Rigadrella, maybe? Oh, wait, no, it's not as nice as I thought it was. It's not as uh, pretty and angular. I don't know what that is. So sponges are one of those creatures that absolutely fascinates me because they're so basic, so primitive, and yet they're still an animal. 
Actually, it does kind of look like Riga Jello. Lila, Lila, what do you think it is? Does it look like Riga Jello? I need to see what the top looks like. No, yeah, it's not no, it's got the in. closed in. It's not closed in. Is it closed in? Yeah, it is. In? Yeah, it's closed it in. Is? Yeah. Okay, maybe it is Riga Jello. Yeah, yeah, now I see the closed in. And that looks like a pom pom anemone in the background behind it. Liponema. So that is spelled. All right. Th thank you, Pilot. I think we've got enough for an ID here. So with the glass sponges, unlike regular sponges, w they are just having spicules to create their shape, or what creates that glassy look to them? They have a, um, a silicate-based structure. They still have spicules, um, and uh, <clears throat> and they but they don't have nearly as much protein. So demo sponges, being the other major class of sponges, um, has a, a much more proteinaceous skeleton made out of something called spongin. Um, and these are a silicate based, have very little tissue. Um, can we look at the greenish coral kind of in the background there? That one's new for this dive. So we've got another metallogorgia here with probably a plexorid right behind it. Hey, uh, Dan, uh, pilots. <gasps> Good God. <laughs> hey, front row, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Dan, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, are you guys using our camera for any of your tasks here? Okay, then we'll keep it on. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll let you know if we need to turn it off, okay? Another one of these metallogorgias here. They seem to be kind of the dominant sponge in this area, uh, along with uh, a fair number of anemones and a fair diversity of anemones. We've seen at least three different uh, types of anemones out here so far. So for the coral that we're looking at right now, it has a stalk, like a flower. Am I looking at that correctly? Yep, it comes up and has a long stalk and then it has kind of this 
flower-like head on it with that's made up of all the polyps, and these almost always have one of these brittle stars in the center of it. So these green lasers you're looking at are, are 10 centimeters apart, and so that uh, <coughs> the head of that Metallogorgia is about four, a little over four inches across to give you a sense of scale. So it's so interesting that these corals come in, er, in these corals, so many corals come in such diversity. The stalked ones that you were just explaining about to your shallow corals, to your deep corals. And then you always throw in those fun, completely different, but the glass sponges. And then there's those two main deep sea sponges, the glass sponges. And then there's another one that you said yesterday. And I can't remember its scientific name. So it looks like we've got an Aritagorgia here coming <clears throat> down the in kind of the center left. Yep, this is an Aritagorgia. Ooh, that is beautiful. Is there a shrimp in the corner? Yep, yes. looks like the bottom left. That looks like something that you would see out of a movie, not not something on our own planet. Pilot, uh, towards the top third of this coral, there appears to be a little pink thing on one of the branches. Any chance we could get a look at that? If it's what I think it is, we might want to try and slurp it too. See if it rotates. Come on, Coral. Twist a little for me. It's like it's just a flower yep, twisting in the that's wind. That's what I think it is. Ah. So <clears throat> this is an undescribed species of jellyfish that we've been seeing all through the Phoenix Islands and all the way up into Hawaii. Hello, Max. And it is a coralivorous jellyfish, we think. So we think this little jellyfish lands on a single polyp of this coral and eats it, one polyp at a time. Um, and it's something we're working with a couple taxonomists to try and um, describe the species. So if we can, if there's any way you think you can slurp that tiny little thing off of the coral, I would appreciate it. Wow. It'll probably fly, it'll probably detach. Yeah. It's very cute. It looks like a little pom pom. And great eyesight to be able to see that. Yeah, I didn't even know. We're at mag zoom. So do we typically see a lot of jellyfish down here this deep, or is that kind of a rarity? They're around. Um, we don't see them so much in right near the, uh, the sea floor. Um, if we got up in the water column and started cruising around, um, we might see some. And we'll, a few will float in. But the deeper we go, the, the less available food is and kind of the sparser organisms get in a lot of places. And so that's why this little jellyfish has possibly found his niche, being a carnivore, eating up, I guess, his cousins, since yep. they're both part of the Cnidarian Absolutely. family. Absolutely. It's called coral livery. Uh, coral livery. Coral livery. So he's a coralivore. <laughs> I just love the naming of that. Coral livery. Coralivore. And so this is the first time you've seen this coravore here in the... In the Line Islands, yeah. Yep. 
New discoveries every minute of this dive. And I think this is actually the second one I've seen this dive. I saw a glance of one earlier, but I wasn't sure. I know we weren't in a good position to get a good look at it. It's ready and loaded. I could just watch this coral wave in the, in the, I don't want to say wind, in the water. So peaceful. Lerp sample coming up. Yeah, any clean jar is fine.
Yes. Yes. <laughs> I felt like I was on pins and needles for like three <laughs> minutes holding my breath. Came off very easy. I thought it might be a little bit more attached to the coral. Dan, I'm applauding you from the second row. That was masterful. All those little corals are saying, thank you, Brian. <laughs> you just saved a life. And before oh, so we pretty. take off here, oh, is that a second one on the bottom? Is there a second um, one of the little jellyfish on the bottom of the coral? Okay, yeah. So we have a joke from an online listener that I think is so very perfect that it cannot be ignored. What did the chi what did the tiny jelly say to the coral it was chomping on after being sampled? What? That sucked. <laughs> so silly. <laughs> after that much tenseness of getting that little jelly. <laughs> It's a very niche joke. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to be like, is there somebody down in the uh, social deck typing yeah. this in? <laughs> okay. So on that same line, I have one of my favorite ocean jokes of all time. Where does the killer whale go to get braces? I feel like I should know this, the answer to this, but I don't. What, where? The orca dauntist. Ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. And don't worry guys, for the online community, I have a million dad jokes to go through. I mean, as a geologist. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many. Okay, so do you have one ready to go in your pocket? Yeah, I mean, you've heard how hard it is to date a geologist, right? The relationships, they always start a little rocky, end in a landslide. <laughs> that is the first geologist joke I've probably ever heard. <laughs> it. It's so bad. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Now I've got to like rack my brain for the perfect one to top that. Mm. <laughs> I've got so many horrible dad jokes. Oh, there he is. There's that yep, little looks like it. coral of ore. Yep, that's fine. Thank you. Wow, it's so We're small. We're at max zoom. Yeah. And it's eating the polyps of the coral? That's what we assume. We always see it in the same kind of uh, situation. Um, where it's on one particular polyp. So since there's two of them, maybe it could be reproduction that they're that close. I, I mean, granted, I, they are hermaphrodite. 
Well, I'll go with hermaphrodites. Do you always, what, is it always Aridogorgia you see them on, or? No, I think we've seen them on some um, bamboos as well, but I'd have to go look. I do feel like we see them on Aridogorgias most often. Oh, there he goes. An ROV pilot, Dan, making that look easy. So Brian, when we get those two uh, coralivores back up to the surface, how will you process them? Or how? Because right now I'm seeing the the container where they're going into, and it's they're so tiny. Yeah, finding them will be hard, and <laughs> and, ho and hoping they weren't damaged too badly in the collection effort um, will uh, is a challenge. Um, but we'll preserve them and uh, send them to. Um, once they get archived at the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology, um, we'll get the samples checked back out to a couple jellyfish taxonomist friends of ours uh, who are working on a description of it. Yep, we should be done with the slurp. Um, and then if before you take off, if we could just do a kind of distant zoom at that coral behind the arm. So when you say preserve, would you keep the entire jar and just pour formalin on it? No, we'll we'll take forceps or tweezers and fish the fish the little gut, little little creature out and put him in a little scintillation vial or something with a high concentration of alcohol. Okay. Feel like you're gonna need some big magnifying glasses to see him. Yeah, so teeny tiny jellies about the size of the polyp they were potentially eating. So if we can take a look at that sponge right next to the lasers and then uh, just zoom on those corals before you take off, that would be much appreciated. Yep. And it's got a little enemy next to it. And I don't know what that is. I have no idea what that was that just floated through the frame. All right, that's good enough for an ID. And if we can just look at that, what I presume is a bamboo coral that's top right out of frame, kind of a meter or two away. Apologies, how about now? All right, yeah, if we can just look at that coral in the top. What 
is that guy floating? I don't, I don't, if you can just give me half zoom is fine. I just want to confirm what I think it is. That's, that's all I need. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. If you can track the little floaty thing down, go for it. There he is. Look at him go. Look at it go. Now it's coming back. Oh no. So I'm loving some of the dad jokes that we're getting on SPL. I'm saving those for a blue water dive. Shark. Don't worry. Ooh. Oh my gosh. Whoa. Check him out. That is awesome. Man. I vote spaceship. Yeah. <laughs> and there's another floaty thing. I don't even have a clue. <laughs> no. It looks like something from like another planet just kind of floating around. That's looks pretty like awesome. a character from Mario. Oh. There Robert, you go. Like Super Smash or something. Oh, look at it. Look at it. What? It looks like a balloon with arms. What in the world is that? That is awesome. I can think oh of several gosh. plankton that kind of look like that, but nothing that should be that big. No. So much so. And it looks pink with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven arms. Great flying. Oh my gosh. Really good flying. Wow. That might be my favorite thing so far. But what was it? <laughs> <laughs> Weird floaty orb. I got nothing. I don't even know what phylum to start start with on that one. Oh. You just missed out on the coolest, weirdest thing. <laughs> so cool. We don't know. <laughs> I kind of want to like get a still frame of that orb and just put it up in like a, my classroom. Weird floaty orb stumps on board scientists. So if anybody is a fan of Pokemon, an online viewer says it looks like Minery, which is now about to be on a Google search. Because I am not a Pokemon, ex po Pokemon, Pokemon expert. Nidoray? Yes, yes. There you go. There's an eel. Oh yeah, it totally does. Oh my gosh. Oh. Yep. So we just saw a real life Pokemon down there. <laughs> and an eel right next to it. <laughs> so we got a shark, an eel, a real life Pokemon, all in one dive, or all in five minutes. All in a day's work. All in a day's work, along with the coral labor. I'm pretty intrigued by the number of anemones here. It's not very common to see this many big anemones at this depth. Another Ritagorgia here, just off 
just on the right of the frame. Big one. Yeah, this one is so much bigger than the other one. So why were there so many jellies on the... Could the jellies be eating it and that's why it's so small? I, I doubt... It's possible, but I would doubt that how the jellyfish eating a polyp the same size it is, it, I could imagine it takes forever to digest a single polyp. <laughs> So I think that mysterious translucent orb might have just topped That's the old zoom. mysterious purple orb from a couple of seasons ago. So as beautiful as this coral is, I'm still in shock over the, the real life Pokemon. I'll be real curious what the internet says it is over the course of the night. Uh, it looks like this one might have a little coral liver's jellyfish too. Interesting. Oh man, you have such good eyes to be able to see that. An online viewer said our mysterious orb was a radiolarian on um, something something. Well, I agree. That was my. I mean, that was my first thought too. Was radiolarian, but they should be way, 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 way smaller. I love this one. One of the viewers says it's honey. I blew up the plankton. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, I think I've got what I need. You're welcome to make the beauty shot if you want, but I'm good from the science point of view. Sure. Sounds good. Well, we can certainly take a few minutes to enjoy this beautiful thing while that happens. That's so... I'm just mesmerized by how beautiful all these deep sea corals are. Yeah, this is probably Aritagorgia magnusporalis, um, which is named for how it's giant, beautiful spirals. I, ju I personally think of these things as Dr. Seuss corals. They. Actually, Back on Dan, it looks like there's another coral down on the left side of this boulder. If we're hanging out here for a minute, can we take a look at it? Absolutely. Oh, and it looks like we might have a cusk eel over on the top left, too. This is probably a primnoid, likely a norella. But as soon as I say that out loud, someone's going to tell me I'm wrong on the beach. <laughs> There's a cup coral below it, though. But yep, I think, yep, I think this is norella. And then that is some type of cup coral, which I won't even hazard a guess at what kind of cup coral it might be. Because I know they'll tell me on the beach I'm wrong, whatever I say it is. Yeah, Rich. Wow. Looking good there, so. Just kind of let it get stretched out a little bit. So many polyps. We got a little shrimp hiding in here with the primnoid oh. as well. All right, science is good on those shots. Roger. 
That's a great zoom level there. You can still see the lasers. And Where'd the eel go? It's right here. It ran away. Maybe the eel saw the shark and swam out. You want to uh, <laughs> zoom out just a bit? Let's see if we can. Another sea anemone? So, yeah, you can keep spinning around, uh, I think, to your left. Trying to keep track of our uh, turns here. Been harder to your left there. Nav, approximately how far to waypoint two are we? Stand by. Sure. Uh, three hundred and thirty meters. Okay, so we still got quite a ways to go. Thanks. Can you bring yeah. it left a little more? And yeah, look uh, north. Look more. Yeah, keep keep them coming. You know, fly, fly backwards for a while. So you want to look uh, reciprocal of 215? Oh, a little tripod fish there, hanging out in the sediment in the bottom right. These oh, it's my first time to see a tripod fish in real life. Ambush predators. They just sit there, and if we get a zoom on it, you'll see these big, basically antenna. Uh, modified fins that are sensories. Um, there you go, and you can kind of see them. Just a little bit more. So it just hangs out there and waits for something to come and tickle That's its good. fins, and then it opens its mouth and sucks it in. And so those big antenna are just modified fins. Yep. Interesting. And he just and seems to be undisturbed by us might have a parasite on its face. Yeah, yeah, that big old white thing. So it's not uncommon for these to come up with parasitic copepods that latch on, get under a, under a, a scale, and just suck the life out of them. Oh, no. And Ooh. I can't tell for sure if that's what that Push is, but it wouldn't yeah. surprise me. You can pause it. Wow. Uh, I think that's actually just a discoloration. I don't think that's actually a parasite. Full zoom. Pretty shot, though. You can see all the detail in those fins. God, he they even beautiful. bifurcate further down. And again, he's just undisturbed by us. He's just chilling. Well, at, at this depth, um, eyes are, aren't very useful because it's mostly dark. <laughs> um, and what you do see is bioluminescence, and that has a pretty narrow range of... Um, light frequencies and so the eye the animals that have eyes or even use their eyes down here are perceive it very perceive light very differently than you know terrestrial animals would so do we know if this guy is able to bioluminesce or biofluoresce in any way i don't know off the top of my head no all right science is good with this one okay so we cool. can uh, slowly go wide there can burns wide Bring your head to the left, uh, about 30 degrees. Yeah, slide back underneath you here. Using you to make sure we don't. Uh, oh, here's our our right second here. urchin of the day. Right, moving out here across the sand. Do a quick zoom there if you want, video. So I didn't think urchins liked being this far down, but clearly they do. Oh yeah, the echinoderms um, are some of the best.